We um, we are the New Bias Academy. If you haven't uh, heard about us from before today, so we had uh, we started in April this year. We had uh, actually now already 21 webinars. We had a huge uh, interest. We had like over 10,000 registrations and the recorded videos on YouTube um, that you can find on the New Bias channel. We, there we collected over 27,000 views. And for today, um, I actually already pass on to Marion, who is uh, who uh, organized the webinar of today to introduce the uh, speakers and moderators of today. So today we have two speakers, uh, for Florian Levet, who is working at Interm in Bordeaux, and Thibault Lagache, who is working at Institut Pasteur in Paris. They are bo both specialists of uh, the analysis of colocalization and advanced methods. Um, so Florian will um, speak for the first part of the webinar, approximately 40, 45 minutes, and then Thibault uh, will continue. So um, uh, we have also a range of panelists uh, here to help answer the questions you have in the Q&A, uh, to moderate the session and to ask also some questions to the speakers. So don't hesitate to uh, ask questions in the Q&A. So Florian, um, the floor is yours. Um, I'll let you share your screen. Okay, is it good? So thank you, Marion. So I'm Florian Levé. I'm part of the team of Jean-Baptiste Ibarita at the Interdisciplinary Institute for Neuroscience. And today I will focus on this first part of the webinar on, uh, on co-localization method for single molecule localization microscopy. Oop, I'm not in presenter mode. Okay, now. Uh, so you already know the speaker and moderator's team and uh, basically my presentation will be a short intro on uh, co-localization and uh, on fluorescence and then on single molecule localization microscopy. I will present a, a few techniques that use unorganized neighborhood methods. The technique we develop, that we developed that is tessellation based and I will do a fast uh, demo of the software I developed at this Colocte Seller. So you can find uh, the software at this uh, link in my, at my GitHub. And you have also access to the slide I will present today uh, on my GitHub. So uh, you, for the one that attended the webinar of last week done by Fabrice Cordelier, you already know about co-localization in fluorescence microscopy, but I have one slide in order to get it back to that. And uh, usually a lot of people that are doing co-localization in fluorescence microscopy are using two very well-known uh, uh, coefficients that are the Pearson correlation coefficient and the Manders coefficient. Uh, so the Pearson is, a, is an indicator that means that you have a, a relative value for the co-localization. It's good to do some comparison, for instance, whereas the Manders coefficient is more a quantifier where you will have a real value of the co-localization. So if we have these two images, where you have some spot uh, and you want to know if they are co-localized or not, it's pretty easy to do this kind of, of, uh, of co-localization analysis, Pearson or Menders, because you have the pixel to pixel uh, correspondence. So for instance, in this image, you have this pixel, it corresponds to this pixel in this image. So it's quite easy to do some uh, computation of the co-localization pixel to pixel with respect to the two stainings that you have. In the case of the Pearson uh, correlation coefficient, what you are going to do is that you will have a scatter plot where you have the intensity in the third channel and the, and the intensity, intensity in the second channel. And for instance, in this case, you have a high value for the intensity in the channel one. So you are very near the end of the scatter plot while it's quite more moderate in the channel two. So you will have a point that is here. And you can do that for Every, point, every pixel in the images, and you will end up with this kind of scatter plot. And then you can compute the Pearson coefficient directly on the, on the, um, on the coordinate of the point in this scatter plot. And you know if you have some exclusion, so no correlation, which means close to minus one, if the two uh, channels are not correlated, 
So this is this kind of fit and then you are around zero of it's correlated. So you have this kind of fit and then it will be uh, close to one. So this gives you some correlation and usually you will use that with different conditions and you will know that one is more co-localized than the other if the, if the value that you get with the Pearson correlation coefficient is higher. And you can do also Mender's coefficient, so more of a quantifier. And in the, now what you are going to do is that you are uh, use the threshold in order to do some segmentation. Uh, for instance, here you can see that some threshold were uh, directly put, that would be the uh, threshold that give you this object here. And then you will just compute some uh, quantifier of the overlap between the two channels. So for instance, for the Mender's coefficient of the channel one, it will uh, be equivalent to the area in yellow divided by the area in magenta. And for uh, the Mender's coefficient of the channel two, it will be equivalent to the yellow uh, area divided by the green area divided by the yellow and green and yellow and magenta here, sorry. So that means that in the case of the channel one, if you add just these two images, you will have a Mendor's coefficient of 0 0.3 here and a coefficient of 0 0.77 here. But that, that's what you are doing when you have images, when you have a pixel to pixel correspondence. Uh, for my talk, I'm talking about single molecule localization microscopy. And now there's something that is really different. Uh, contrary, on contrary to fluorescence microscopy where you are going to uh, have all the fluorophore in the image on an image, everything at the same time. And so if you are on white field, for instance, you will have the problem of the diffraction limit uh, of the light, and then you won't be able to uh, see uh, structures that are below around 250 nanometer. In the case of the single molecule localization microscopy, we are able to only illuminate, only switch on a few, a spare subset of the fluorophore, like you can see here. And because they are very sparse, we are really able to localize them very precisely, for instance, using some Gaussian fitting. And then we have the real position with some uncertainty of the localization. And then you can reconstruct your data with basically a point cloud in 2D or 3D. So the, the coordinates of the molecules. But then now, how can we use this localization in order to do the computation of the co-localization? Because here we really have points. At first, people just get back to what they knew and they did image reconstruction. So basically you have uh, the pixel size of your camera, which is for instance, in this case, 160 nanometer. So here you can see a defected limited images. Basically, we don't see anything in this region here. If you have the localization, you have the sub-pixel localization that you can see here. So you can say, okay, I will have a pixel size. I will define a pixel size, new image with a pixel size of 20 nanometer. You will have these images then, and you just sum, you just project every localization in the pixels, and then you will have this kind of images. And you can apply a Gaussian that is uh, dependent of the uncertainty in the localization precision of your localization. And then you will have an image that is smoother. And because you have image, you can go back to something like a Pearson coefficient or the Mender's coefficient in order to compute the co-localization. But in, in a way, it's very pitiful because we spend so much time to try to find the correct position of the localization. Uh, we are in a continuous space because we have a point cloud in 2D and 3D, and it is pitiful to go back to an image to discretize the information and to lose some information that we have with the localization. So. When we have two staining, we have two point clouds, and we want to be able to quantify the localization, the level of co-localization between these two point clouds. So there is different solution. You can do some object-based co-localization. So you will compute some statistics on some segmented object on your localization. But that's something that I won't talk about because it will be developed in part two by Thibault. And you can do some, uh, so there were a few techniques that were specifically designed in order to work with single molecule localization microscopy uh, that are using unorganized neighborhood techniques. They are ideas that you are going to compare the spatial distribution of the two channels in a defined vicinity for each localization. So for instance, uh, in 2014, Rossial just uh, released a technique that is based on the Gettys and Franklin method. So here you can see that you have, it's a basic simulation with some uh, 
circular uh, clusters that are um, separated, but with some overlap. And where, what I put here is that we have exactly the same density between the two staining, the localization density. So here you can see a magnification of one of the clusters. What you are going to do is that you are going to define a radius and you are going to count the number of localization inside this uh, radius in your color and in the other color. And with this number, you can compute the L value. And you can see that here, this is what I say. You compute this value here is a number of, uh, of localization in the color in the radius. You divide by the number, the total number of localization of your data. You multiply by the area of the total the total area of the data and you divide by P. Basically, what you are doing is that you are doing some kind of normalization with respect to uh, the radius of research and to the area of your image, of your data. And th that's very important to do some normalization because when you are doing single molecule localization microscopy, you can have stainings that, we, that are a very different localization density. Uh, because it will depend on the on the fluoroform, the labeling, on the acquisition time, and so you can really have different density with your two colors. When you have done that, you have a L value for each of the localization. You can put them in a scatter plot, and then you can just define a threshold on the scatter plot in order to find uh, the localizations that are co-localized. What we saw when we tested that is that even if there is some normalization, uh, you can see that if we change the ratio of one of the colors, so now we have five times more localization in the first channel, the frame of the scatter plots change. Here we were between 150 and 150, and now we are between 150 in this color and 90 in the other color. That means that if you put this threshold in order to uh, segment to find the colocalization in this uh, ratio one to one data set. You put exactly the same threshold here. You won't have exactly the same, uh, the same uh, colocalization analysis. And that's something that can be problematic if you have a lot of different uh, data to analyze, a lot of different cells. If you need to change your threshold, that's something that is problematic. So the normalization is, is really good, but not sufficient, we think, for what we need to do. Another technique that was published in 2012 is the coordinate-based colocalization uh, technique that was developed uh, by uh, Sebastian Malkusch in the, in the team of Mike Elliman. And again, the idea now is to define a radius, but now you have a number of bins. And what does the number of bins is that it will divide the space of your radius in different bins where you are going to compute the number of localization. So basically, you here, you say you want five bins and the maximum is 50 nanometers, that means that each bin will be 10 nanometers. And you compute the number of localization in the two color in the bin. So here we have one red and two green. So we do that. Now we are going to the, to the second uh, ring here. And we can compute that in this ring here, we have four localization red, four red localization and three green localization. And then we do that for each of the bin, this one, this one, this one. And we put that in a scatter plot. And then you can compute the Spearman rank correlation. That gives you the same kind of ID than the Pearson coefficient. But why don't we use Pearson coefficient here? That's again because of the difference in the localization density that you can have between different uh, staining in single molecule localization microscopy. Because the Pearson coefficient will expect that you linear that you have a linear relation between your two. Uh, your two value, your two, um, the density in channel one and the density in channel two. And that's something that is very difficult in single molecule localization microscopy that, because that means that you need to have the same density for the two channel. And when you do Spearman co rank correlation, you don't need this linear, uh, this linear relationship between the two density. And that's very interesting for single molecule localization microscopy. So. Here, I just explain you a very basic way of how it works because it's a little more complicated than that. First, it's not the number of localization that you are doing, but it's something a little more complicated where you are 
or again normalizing with respect to the to the area of your research. And when you do spear migraine correlation, you are not doing the fit on uh, the direct uh, values that you compute here, but on the rank. So that means that here you can see the rank. Here I did it on the number, but it would be done on this computation here, and we can see that here the first when you rank, basically you have your array and you do a sorting. And for that means that this one is the first, this one is second, here third, fourth, and five. And you do that exactly in the same uh, with the second color. And then you do your uh, your correlation on this rank, not directly on the on the on the values that you compute here. But I wanted to have something pretty much uh, clear to understand. And in the end, still you are doing your rank correlation and you know that if you are close to minus zero you have exclusion if you are close to zero you don't have any correlation and if you are close to one you have a, a, a very big correlation with your two staining so here you can see that uh, i have two um, two different conditions here some overlap of the cluster and here a full co-localization and i have uh, define here uh, a radius of research of 15 nanometer and a number of bin of five. And we really managed to have, we can see on the distribution of the of the Spearman rank correlation of each of the localization that we are a lot more co-localized in, uh, in this case. Still, the problem is that you have two value. And that means that every time you have two value, you can change uh, any of these two and you can have some results that will be different so it can be quite difficult to find exactly what are the correct parameters when you have two parameters in order to find uh, the proper uh, uh, computation of your co-localization and another problem uh, that they had in the paper is that they computed the number of uh, the percentage of co-localization as the number of localization that were uh, higher than the threshold divided by the total number of uh, localization. And in this case, that means that here, you can see that we have exactly the same cluster, but in this case, we just have more green point in the background. Well, in this case, that means that here we have more co-localization than in this case, because now the background is higher. And that's something that can again uh, happen in single molecule localization where one of your staining may be less specific so you will have more localization in the background and that's something that is problematic when you want to compute the co-localization and so in 2016 Pajon et al tried to um, uh, uh, improve this technique and they uh, they released the closed doc technique which is uh, combination of db scan and the coordinate based co localization so the uh, db scan is the density based spatial clustering analysis with noise is a segmentation technique so i would just for the ones that uh, already attend uh, the webinar on the single molecule localization uh, analysis you already know that because i presented it but i will do a few slides in order to explain to the other what is db scan and really, DBSCAN is a segmentation technique. So what you want to do is segment some part of the localization and say that they are object of interest for you. Uh, you organize the localization with respect to three classes. They are the core point, the density reachable point, and the Wittler point. And again, you have two parameters, the radius of research in order to compute the density, and the mean number of points that will define uh, if your point is a core point or not. And basically, if you have just this small cluster, for instance, and you define a mean point of four. That means that you have this value of radius. You will compute the number of localization here. So it's five. Five is bigger than four. So you have a core point. And then if you go here, you have two points. So it's not a core point, but one of the neighbor is a core point. So it's a density reachable point. And in this case here, you have only one point, so it's below four and there is no core point in the vicinity. So it's a, it's a Hoodler point. You do that for every one of the localization, you end up with this kind of classification. And it will say that your object is the core point and the density reachable points. And then you have your object and the background. And the idea with ClusDoc was to limit the co-localization analysis to cluster, to not have this problem with the background. So you do DB scan, you segment your cluster in the two uh, in the two color. Here you can see the first cluster in magenta and the second cluster in green. And then you compute the co the coordinate uh, based uh, co-localization only inside the point of the clusters. 
But what we, the problem here is that you have five parameters. So you have two for DB scan, two for coordinate based co localization, one for the threshold. So maybe you can use the same radius for DB scan and uh, the coordinate and CBC, but it's not uh, even sure because the techniques are not exactly in the, you don't compute exactly the same value for the density. So maybe you cannot use exactly the same radius. And what we see is that if you have a radius a ratio of one to one and one to five, for instance, in this case, with a lot more of the green uh, localization, you have a real problem with DB scan because DB scan use hard threshold. So you cannot uh, directly have a normalization and, and you really need to have a threshold that is dependent of your density. So if you fix a threshold and put it on every one of your cells, you will end up with this kind of segmentation for one of the of the staining. And then your collocalization become to, to be rubbish because now you have done the CBC on all this localization here. And then you can see here that now you have a, a bigger colocalization that in this case, just because you have some point in the background. And if we go back to the fluorescent microscopy, as I, I presented in the in my first slide, so what we call gold standard uh, is the Pearson and Menders coefficient, but it's basically because a lot of people are using it since they are very easy to use and understand. And you can use that because you have the same image dimension. Uh, for long, there was no equivalent possibility in single molecule localization microscopy, but because there is no easy way to link to localization since they are not at the same position. The problem with the uh, techniques that are existing for analysis of uh, multicolor or single molecule localization microscopy data is that they can be, they are very nice, they are very good normalization and this kind of stuff, but they can be difficult to generalize to all shapes and density. And some of the, the parameters that you need to use are really dependent of the shape or the density. And so at some point we were interested in trying to adapt the Pearson and, Man the Pearson and Manders coefficient to multicolor single molecule localization microscopy. And we really wanted to have something that was robust to the variability in shape and density. And uh, for a few years now, we are working with Voronoi diagram which uh, is a space subdividing technique and that is anisotropic by nature. And uh, we really like this, uh, this structure because for one localization, you create one polygon. So you can really see that here you have the localization and you can see the Voronoi diagram. And uh, very basically, any point of the space that is inside the polygon is closer to this point than to any other localization. So that's really the way to find these edges. It's the bisectors between the two points. And uh, there are very nice features of Voronoi diagram. Uh, and for instance, you have the connectivity. So you know the direct neighbors. So the polygons that share one an edge. So for this one, we know that his direct neighbors are this one, two, three, four, five, six uh, localization. And it's very scalable. That means that the denser the localization are, the smaller the polygon will be. And then with this kind of, of information, you can really have very good, you can add some very interesting features to the, to the localization. And what we did is that we wanted to do some generalization of that. And we can use the polygon to, to compute a set of different statistics. So for instance, if we are at this localization, we know it's polygon, obviously. So if we add the rank zero, the number is one, the localization here, the area is the area in yellow, the area of the polygon, and the density is one divided by this area. If we go to the rank one, we know the direct neighbor, so now the number is five, the area of the old polygons is the yellow plus green, and then the density is five divided by the total area. You can do for the that for the rank two and the rank k, but what we did is using the rank one because we find it very interesting since it has a, a smoothing effect on the uh, on the computation of the of the density and here you can see that the color of the different uh, polygons are uh, directly related to the density so this one is a denser on all the localization that we have in this in this uh, data here and what we saw is that with the Voronoi, we can do some kind of a Voronoi normalization. So it's not a real normalization at the mathematical point of view, but we call it a normalization in a very easy way. So if you have this kind of clusters here that you can see, 
Uh, and here we have a ratio one to five. So we have five more localization here, but you have exactly the same threshold. If we do the computation of the local density, as I explained it, you will have these two histogram. What, what we can see here is the logarithmic distribution of the density, is that the two histograms are shifted, which is expected because here it's denser. But if we apply some threshold, obviously here we have chose the threshold between the background and the, and the clusters. So we have a nice selection of the localization in the cluster. But if we, ex if we apply exactly the same threshold to this denser data set, now we have a lot of localization in the background that are selected. So that's quite bad. And what we saw is that a very simple Voronoi normalization uh, is that you can divide the density that you compute for each of the localization divided by the average density of your data set. And you end up with this result where you can see that now the two histogram are on the same frame and that if we apply a threshold at zero, so because it's a logarithmic distribution, it means one times the average density, you will really manage to uh, select the localization that are in the cluster. So it's that very interesting because now we can use this kind of normalization in order to apply the same uh, technique, the same automatic technique to all the cells in a data set. And what we did first in 2015 was we wanted to use that for segmentation. So we compare the local density to the average density of the data set. And we use that in order to do some segmentation of synaptic protein. So we managed to find the number of uh, Ampara uh, receptor in nanodomain. And what we were interested in is to see if it's really robust because we did that for uh, synaptic protein, but then we use that in order to do some uh, clustering in, uh, in uh, automatic segmentation of 9060 weight plates. So a lot of di different data, we just use exactly the same threshold and we managed to do some really nice uh, segmentation where we see that the clustering was different dependent on the render of concentration. And since the, rele the, the release of our software, a lot of different groups have used that, for instance, in plant biology or for viruses. And we have seen that really this segmentation, this selection of some uh, localization that are part of uh, object or of interest is really robust to the localization density. But then now we were at the moment where we have these two staining and we want to be able to, from these two staining, uh, so from having the possibility to have one Voronoi diagram for each of the staining, to be able to arrive to this kind of result where we could be able to classify the localization with respect to if they are in the background, it's some high density in one color or co-localized. And in the end, the technique is very easy and is really just taking uh, benefit of the, of the features of the Voronoi diagram. So if you have this very simple simulation with two clusters that have some overlap, you have your two Voronoi diagram. Now you can do like for the Gettys and Franklin framework or for the Pearson uh, coefficient. You can have a scatter plot when you will plot each point with the density in channel one and the density in channel two. Obviously, if you have a red point here, it's very easy to find its density in its color because we know it's polygon. So for instance here, we have a high density in the first color. But in the end, it's as, equal, as, as easy to find the density in the second color because this point is inside a polygon and we know this polygon is dependent on this localization. So we can find the density uh, of the other, uh, of the other um, uh, staining for this point. That is this one. So now we know that this point is high density in the color one and low density in the color two. So we put it on this scatter plot at this position. If we go to this point here, we see that it's a low density in both channel. So now we have point that is here. If we go to this point here, we have a high density in the two color. So we have a point that is here. We can do that for all points in the data set. Obviously we can separate the two uh, scatter plot to have one scatter plot 
per color. And then we can apply the threshold that I show before very robustly in order to have something that we will call the Voronoi Manders coefficient. And with this uh, threshold, we are now also able to color uh, to have our different classification of our localization. So now we know that the uh, localization in the background are black. In yellow and cyan, we have localization that have identity in one color, and in blue and red, we have localization that have identity in both color. And we can compute the Manders, uh, the Voronoi Manders coefficient as the total of the density of the localization in red divided by the total of the density of the localization in yellow and red. And we can do that also for the second color with blue and cyan and blue. We have also a way to compute a very generic Spearman rank correlation on all the data set by just using the Spearman rank correlation on this whole scatter plot here. And this one, obviously. So we have this data set. We end up with this kind of result where we can really see directly where are the co-localized region and where are the value of identity in the two color. So we wanted to see if really this uh, technique was uh, robust. So we use some experimental controls. For instance, we use microtubules where we had a DNA paint acquisition and we uh, separated our acquisition in two. So it's one data, one cell that we divided into in order to have two uh, perfectly co-localized data. And what we did is also, we, we can see here different here we with very, a lot of microtubules, very few and uh, between the two. And we also uh, varied the localization density in one of the color. So you can see that in magenta, we always have the, exactly the same number of localization, but on the second color, we start from something that is one to one ratio to something that is one to 10 ratio. So one, we, are, we uh, removed 90% of the localization. And when we plotted everything, we see that we have a very high value for the Manders coefficient, even in this case where we have a very few microtubules. And in all cases, even when we have a ratio of one to 10. So it's very, very nice. And we don't have 100% because we are still uh, on single molecule localization microscopy uh, data. So we always have some differences. Uh, we don't have pixels. So we have differences on the border of the, of the localization of the structure of interest. We then, uh, so our technique is working in 2D in 3D. So we did a very basic testing in order to see that in 3D, indeed it's working really well. So here you can see some microtubule and the nucleus and uh, the nucleus is below the microtubule. And so when we did our analysis in 3D, we had a Mendoz coefficient of close to 0%, which was very nice. And in this case, for all this data, they were acquired by Remy and analyzed by Remy and, and Corey of the team. Then we asked some collaborators, so Philip Oss and John Harris at UMBL, to give us some data of nuclear pore complex because they are very challenging. Uh, here you can see two proteins, one of the nucleus and one on the periphery of the nuclear pore complex. Basically, I think the, the nucleus is something like around 60 nanometer. So every time you do some co-localization analysis, it's dependent on the resolution. And uh, having this kind of here, what we want to have is something that is not co-localized because we have the nucleus and something that is at the periphery. But uh, with this kind of resolution, it's very difficult to find a very good estimation of this no co-localization. And here you can see a result in 3D of one of the nuclear pore complex. So here I'm showing in 2D because, well, in 3D, the Voronoi diagram is quite difficult to understand. But you can see that we will have a dense uh, region here and then solution here, here and here. And in the end, we managed to really see that we have a very low uh, co-localization analysis for the nuclear power complex. So we were really happy where you can see that we really managed to say that we are not co-localized even in these very uh, challenging uh, data sets. In the end, we also use that in order to uh, do some quantification of uh, data that were already uh, quantified in 2014 by some of our collaborators, but by using reconstructed super resolution image. So you have the PSD uh, that is a postsynaptic uh, protein. And then you had some uh, proteins that are either part of the nucleation or the elevation 
of the dendrite. And so when you are at the nucleation, you are very close to the PSD, which is the case of Abby. So you have a very high colocalization. But for the VASP, for instance, you are on the elongation, so you are far from the PSD, and you wouldn't expect to have some uh, high col uh, colocalization. And we are very happy because we had very similar results to what they did, but at the time they used reconstructed super resolution images. So they had a workflow that was pretty complex and not easy to generalize. And in our case, we just applied a threshold of uh, one times average density on all the cells. So basically I click on a button and I got the result. So I was pretty happy with that. Uh, so to end, the software uh, I spoke of are available. So SRT seller for the segmentation is available at my GitHub and you have a one-click window installer and the code source is available. For collect sellers that I just presented here, you can also, you have a one-click window installer on my GitHub. The code source is still pending because, uh, well, it's quite a mess. So I need to clean it and I decided that I will uh, merge the two software on one, so it's taking a little more time than uh, expected, but in the end, everything will be on the same uh, platform. So it will be easier to have everything in 3D and 3D uh, directly on the same platform. Uh, so I want to thank obviously all the people of my team and uh, particularly Jean-Baptiste, my boss, Rémi and Corey that help with the acquisition and the localization analysis of the data. Our collaborators at the laboratory, Olivier Rossier, Grégory, Giannone, Eric Ozzi, Daniel Choquet. Our collaborators at UMBL, John Harris and Philippe Hauss. All the funding agency. Again, the information about SRT seller and collect seller. So because it's on GitHub, you have the possibility to, uh, if you have issue to raise and here. There is also, we are part of the image.cs forum. So you have the tact seller if you have some question here and then I can answer. And now we'll do a very fast demo of uh, collect seller. So when you want uh, to download it, as I said, you have my GitHub, uh, my GitHub account where you will find uh, Collect Seller and, and uh, the Nobias Academy for the slide, Collect Seller and Assert Seller. So if you go to Collect Seller, you have a release here. So for now, it's empty because there is no code source, but you have the release. So you can go here and uh, download it and download the manual. Then you can install it. And when you have installed it, you have that. On the data set, you have a zip. So you can unzip and have a few of the, of uh, a few data that you can test it. When you want to open uh, data, so you can either open directly a whole directory or one localization file. So we'll open the directory. So I go to data set and I will take, for instance, the simulation in 3D. So it open everything. And uh, here, because it's Collect SLR, you cannot do some segmentation and this kind of stuff. You just have the colocalization analysis. So you click here. You have the possibility to just create one colocalization data set or to run on all the open uh, data. In this case, it will use the name of the, of the data set in order to do the corresponding between the two colors. And if you do that, it will create the Voronoi diagram and do the computation. So here you can see that the Voronoi diagram is very uh, not, uh, beautiful and it's because it's in 3D. And uh, as of right now, we, uh, for Collect Serial, we don't have a 3D viewer, only 2D. So that because of that, that uh, it seems really bizarre. But if you go to the colocalization here, you will have the scatter plot that I show you have the possibility to have some um, display. So the original localization, the classification or the Voronoi diagram. And uh, you can change the threshold. When you have ROE, you can uh, compute the value on the ROE and then you can compute the coefficient. And when you click, you can see that uh, everything is uh, updated with your new value. value. And here you can every, close everything if you want on one click and then go back to, for instance, the 2D data set, open everything, very basic simulation, do again the computation of the, of the colocalization. Here you can see that it's a 2D 
data set. So now the Voronoi diagram seems to something that we can understand. And again, you have everything that is uh, updated depending on, uh, on the data. And that's all, I will finish with that. So if you have any question. Okay, there, there, there is a few questions, but uh, not so much in the, the Q&A, so it seems that you are very clear. Um, did you listen to me, Florian? That's okay. Yeah, I hear I, 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 you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, which technique did you use for the 3D, so which modality by plane or astigmatism? It was, in our case, for our data, it was astigmatism. Yeah, but it works for any modality. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, basically, collected cellular is just taking uh, a localization files, so coordinates. So you already have to do the localization before, but if you if you are using bitplane, in the end, you will still have a coordinate in X, Y, and Z. So obviously, you can open it in collected cellular. Mm -hmm. um, so the the software yeah, about the software. So the software is freely available on yep. GitHub. Yes, is, there is a, is two two software available for Mac. No, uh, for Mac I don't have Mac, so I never tried to do the compilation. Mm -hmm. uh, so for now, for a certain seller, the code source is on. So anyone that has a Mac can try to comp compile it. I think I put a CMake list, so it should be uh, easier. Mm -hmm. I would expect, uh, I, I, yeah, there is a CMake, CMake list, so CMake can help to do the, the compilation. I would expect to not have put Windows specific uh, function. It may be a, f a couple of them still, but I think I'd really try to not have anything uh, specific to Windows in the code. Uh, but no, I don't have Mac, so I never did the compilation. And for collected sellers, the SUS card is, is not uh, available still. So when I will release the complete platform, there will be the, all the collocation inside. Again, it will be with a CMake uh, list, so to help uh, compilation, but I'm not mm -hmm. able to do uh, a Mac compilation. Mm -hmm. And there is a, the last question about, uh, okay, can Voronoi analysis be applied to segmentation of spots? Uh, for, like we have a local, uh, maxim, local maximum segmentation, this kind of things for spots. Yeah. Is it for that or for localization process? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I would say why not? Why not? Uh, if you have only one spot, uh, no, I would say no, yeah. because uh, still Voronoi is uh, performing better when you have some data. For mm -hmm. very sparse data, it's not the best solution for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, if your spot is uh, several localization, so yes, it's uh, basically going back to cluster analysis. So I would say yes. Uh, so it, yeah, it depends. If it's one localization, no, mm -hmm. I would say no. Okay, there is a, a last question. <laughs> uh, how large uh, can a data set could be? Uh, what is the maximum of localization that you can manage? Uh, so for this version, I would say maybe a couple of million. Couple of million Even yeah. in 3D, it will be long, but uh, I think it should work. Uh, for the next release, when I will put everything in, it will be several millions in 2D and 3D. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the question uh, appeared <laughs> now. Okay. Uh, uh, there is plans for an image or Fiji plugin? Uh, at some point, I wanted to try to do that and mm -hmm. I don't have time. So I try to have some funding for that, but never managed to. So it's uh, complicated because I'm still using C++, so it's not developed in Java. It's not the same language. Uh, because I want it to be very uh, efficient and very uh, to, to, to be able to handle millions of localization in even in 3D. And uh, porting it to Java is not so easy. It's not just done in one day. So yeah, if some, at some point I manage to have some funding to do that, I would be very interested in doing that. But uh, mm -hmm. me, I don't have the time to do that. It's too much work. It's specifically difficult for the visualization, I expect. Yeah. yeah, well, visualization, I think, could be, well, there, there is OpenGL in Java, so it should be okay. It's more like uh, the quantification. 
and uh, TSLR is several tens of thousands of lines of code. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a very a really lot of work to to put it on another language. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so another question, uh, so practical question. So uh, the, the the participant asks. So he has two list of uh, of coordinates. So is it possible to upload the two channel separately in the in the software? Uh, what does collect seller now is that it will open one localization file per staining. And then you click on the button in order to link the two and create the co-localization object. Yeah. So, so there yeah. is no, no possibility to have the two staining in the same file. Yeah. So, so you it, has, it has to merge in some way, it is it's fine. Uh, but my understanding is that he has one file per staining. So it's perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's Mario, uh, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's it. There was la one last question about the format uh, that you read for the software in, uh, as input and maybe a, a, a more generally, generally, where can we find some documentation? Uh, there is a manual, but maybe in the manual of Colloc Tesla, I don't speak about the, the format. That's possible. Basically, the format for Colloc Tesla is the one that is uh, done by, is the same as Thunderstorm. So it's a CSV with the same uh, name for the column. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's thank it. You. We don't have other questions. Uh, thank you, Florian, for your talk. And then we move on to, uh, to Thibaut. Uh, so, yeah. Thibaut, the floor is yours. I will share your slides with the participants. Okay, so, hi, hi everybody. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, okay. Mm. Okay, I think this is the first time I'm sharing my screen. I should have started. Oh, is it? Mm. Where is the uh, the button to share the screen? The green button at the bottom in the middle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's quite obvious, actually. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK. OK, I hope you can see it. Is yeah. everything OK? Yeah. You can see it? OK. Uh, uh, welcome everybody, and uh, thanks to this, uh, the organizer of Nobias Academy. It's a really nice uh, initiative, and I hope it, uh, it will continue for a long time. So in this second part, I will uh, give some details about the statistics to analyze the spatial distribution of objects. And objects uh, are quite general. This can be in any type of microscopy, and also for a localization in SMLM, but this is like more uh, a general um, framework. So my name is uh, Thibault Lagache. I'm a researcher in the Bioimage Analysis Unit at Institut Pasteur. Um, the head of the unit is uh, Jean-Christophe Olivier Marin. And everything that I will show you today about uh, so SODA, the, the plugin uh, we developed, is available in IC, a bioimage analysis uh, platform that can be that is free, open source, and can be downloaded uh, through this uh, address. So uh, we'll just give again actually a general outline to explain uh, where we are going from a co-localization problem to uh, a point process and a special analysis problem. Then there will be a second part uh, specifically dedicated to this uh, special analysis of uh, marked point processes. Um, and uh, at the end, I will uh, give you an example of some analysis we did with um, Lydia Danglo, who is uh, also here today, uh, to analyze a special organization in three color uh, structural illumination microscopy. Just to show you can map uh, the organization of synapses at uh, the entire neuron level. So uh, I think that uh, you have understood that 
to do some colloquialization. So colloquialization, actually, it's not easy. It's like a pipeline. And so typically, a first step when you do such type of pipeline is to at least decrease the noise and sometimes detect the object or the localization of, uh, of your objects. And then based on this, uh, there are quite a few standard approach, like the correlation between uh, extractive uh, pixel or signal, the overlap of, uh, of, of the mass that you can uh, detect, or uh, distance-based approach. So for uh, those of you that have watched the webinar of uh, Fabrice Cordelier last week, he uh, talked about the first order statistics where you look at whether or not the center of some objects are inside the mask of the others. And more generally, uh, there is a lot of distance-based, second order distance-based approach. In those approach, uh, you are going to look at the distance between neighbors, quite generally. And, uh, and then, and this is, a, let's say, the most difficult part is to interpret and uh, to give a statistical significance of your results because you can more or less always observe an overlap or uh, a correlation between signal. But uh, does it mean something? And uh, to answer this question, I think this is the most difficult question to answer. And uh, most of the time, uh, what you can do is like to uh, shuffle your signal or uh, let's say to randomize your localization, et cetera, to extract some uh, p-values and statistics. But that's, that's, not, that's not really easy. Uh, and so this was just a general overview of like a co-localization pipeline. And, um, and, and that's, that's good. Many techniques have been developed. And as you have observed with uh, the previous part of Florian, all these uh, approaches are, um, are being questioned with the introduction of uh, super resolution microscopy, because now we have access to uh, the localization directly of objects, or even more generally, we have uh, before the yellow, let's say it disappears because we have an increased resolution for the red and the green objects, and there is no, not so much yellow right now in your uh, images. And so, uh, this is really the sensitivity of many methods to uh, the microscope PSF, um, I think it's, it's, a, it's really a problem. And this uh, explains some way, in a way, uh, the development of the object-based techniques that you're going to try really to uh, localize your objects or your localization directly in, uh, in, a, in, in a SMLM. And then you're going to directly work on these objects. Because otherwise, for example, if you look at the overlap or the correlation of signal, you can obtain completely different results depending on the microscope you're using. And the second issue when developing a colocalization analysis, and this issue is, is being more and more uh, important right now, again, with also the increased resolution, is the contextual interpretation of uh, what you observe. Because typically, two objects or more can be closed. And this sometimes have no significance at all because it, it, it is really, let's say that it is really significant if the space is empty. And this is something that uh, Florian showed before that really depending on the context and the background of, uh, of your uh, field of view, the proximity can have a lot of sense or not. And uh, this is exact same uh, thing that having if, if someone is really close to you in an empty space, it's much more uh, frightening than uh, being in the subway, typically. Okay. And so uh, all this uh, small introduction was uh, to justify the use of a very general mathematical framework, the mark point processes, to analyze the spatial relations between objects with, uh, with some robustness. And uh, just before, um, we have introduced uh, the term coupling to uh, more generally look at the distance between objects, because you can have objects that overlap, but with increased resolution, clearly many objects are not completely overlapping or not at all, but still, uh, there is a special relation between them. So, and this special relation can be a direct interaction, or the co-presence of molecules in a larger complex, 
or in a larger organelle, or for example, the synaptic opposition. And the, the, the common thing between all these um, situations is that you will have a significant spatial relations at some distance between different objects, and not specifically like overlap or something. So this is uh, something that is more general and that has uh, a lot of sense for a super resolution microscopy. And, and then, uh, how you can go from pixels to objects. So in many cases, in many cases, when you image molecules, these molecules are uh, subdiffractive, meaning that um, their size is, let's say, below the resolution of the microscope. So typically what you observe is the PSF of the microscope or a small object plus a big arrow of the PSF. So typically you will have a lot of objects that you can segment with different techniques like a pure Schwarzschilder or something that is more uh, robust, like a wavelet analysis or convolution with a log Gaussian. And at the end, you will have like segmented objects with a given shape, a given color, and a given position. And from there, you can represent your objects in your uh, field of view as a collection of uh, objects with a position, a point, and uh, a mark, which will be, for example, the color, the shape, etc. So typically, each image can be seen as a marked point process representation. And a marked point process, this is just a stochastic process, meaning that what you observe is a realization of some uh, stochastic processes. And what you want to know if, for example, if the uh, marked point process that is green and the marked point process that is red, are they related? And, at which distance. And uh, I forget to say that typically the uh, localization in uh, super resolution microscopy in SMLM are uh, per se some um, marked point processes because typically you have a color and a position. And so this is an example of some uh, synaptic molecules that have been imaged with 3D stamp by uh, Lydia uh, Danglo at, at the uh, so in French, some of the Catherine Neuroscience and Neuroscience and Psychiatry Center in Paris. So now this is uh, the second part. So we have a good representation of the objects, let's say, the or the position in our field of view. But what can you extract from this? And this is like the second part. This is how you analyze partially this mark point processes to extract uh, reliable information. And there will be some equations uh, for people that are interested in. If you are not interested in, in, in the matter, in the statistics, you, you can just skip it. So just before that, I will give a very short review. Uh, and this is quite similar to uh, what uh, Florian just presented, but just to give, uh, to, to really set uh, the idea. So typically when you have object or localization, the first idea is let's say to come back to some things that we know and to look at the correlation or the overlap between molecule clusters or at least between areas with high density of molecules. And so as, as Florian presented, this area, this dense area can be segmented with DB scan or uh, some replay uh, dependent functions. Uh, the, 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 I, I forgot the name. Or oh, um, here, this is also a replay related function in, this, uh, in the article of uh, Rossi and Al where you have so, so you have some dense region and then you're going to look either the correlation or the overlap or the, the correspondence in a Voronoi di diagram. So there is a lot more to, to, to speak about all these uh, techniques and I refer uh, to part one. And um, there is a second strategy. So my classification is a little bit uh, different from uh, the classification of Florian, but in this second strategy, this is a coordinate uh, based localization that um, he, he really described. But more generally, this type of strategy, I call this like the single object. And the object can be a localization or even a pixel because we can have examples of such techniques like more than 20 years ago in confocal microscopy. Mapping of co-clustering. So the idea is to look at each pixel or each localization and look around if there is any like co-clustering, co- um, high density 
of uh, of the two probe or the two colors. And these two techniques are, um, I mean, they are interesting. And um, let's say that they look at local properties of signals. And uh, these local properties, let's say this is more or less co-clustering or uh, correlation of identity between signals. And the third strategy that we have developed and especially it was especially useful at least for us because uh, we looked at synaptic apposition and for the synaptic apposition like the co-clustering or the co-relation of signal in most cases is going to fail especially in super resolution microscopy because sometimes you don't have uh, you don't have any spots that overlap or that correlate so we developed something like a, um, a bit more uh, general at uh, from the distance point of view and we decided to really analyze statistically the distance directly between objects. And so if the distance is zero, this, this is the, like, say, the overlap. But more generally, or you can extract information from the distance. And for this, you uh, have to first characterize the distance. So this is the first equation. The, the right now there is three, four slides where I'm going just to enter into the detail, or you can extract uh, statistical information from the position of the different object and the distance between objects. So first you have to quantify uh, the relations at different distance between objects. And a very well-known and widely used uh, process is the replace function, or here this is something that is related to the replace function. So the idea is to take, for example, the first object, the green one, and to count at different uh, concentric uh, ready the number of molecules that are going to uh, fall into the different annulus or in 3D, this is in the different uh, sphere around uh, the points. And so you, you will have a number. So for example, you will have that, oh, I have a mean number of three molecules around at a distance comprised between four and five pixels. Okay, so what can you do with this? And this is the main part. Is Okay, we characterize this distance related to some null hypothesis. So here's the null hypothesis is that, okay, everybody is random, especially the second population. And so under this hypothesis, how much do I expect to have uh, molecules in each annulus? And this is what is important and interesting is in which annulus I am observing a significant accumulation of objects, meaning that there is a special relation at this specific distance. And this is where is, is coming the statistical analysis of this replace function. And so uh, quite rapidly, we have found that the, the, the expected number of objects under the null hypothesis of randomness inside this annulus is just a Gaussian. And so we just need to compute the mean and variance. So it's not completely is the mean and variance is going to depend on the molecule density, the surface of the field of view, and um, some boundary correction because for uh, points or objects that are close to the boundary, we expect less neighbors. And uh, the interactions between the green objects that are going to share some uh, red neighbors. And when you take into account all this uh, stuff, you can, so this is the second slide with some formula, you can derive the expectations, the mean number of uh, molecules that you expect in each annulus, which is going to be proportional to the surface of the annulus, and the variance. So the variance is going to depend on the, the mean, the boundary corrections, and a big term in blue, which is going to account for this uh, inter the annulus intersection between the different green points. So this is an interaction term. So it's quite complicated, but at the end of the day, you have a zero mean and uh, unit variance variable. So at, in each annulus, you expect if there is no coupling that each number, uh, each reduced number of molecules in each annulus is going to just to uh, follow a standard Gaussian law. And then you can have, and this is what is interesting here, is that you have a multi-distance analysis because you can then have a Gaussian vector in the different annulus around your uh, green objects. And, and 
but once you have like let's say a Gaussian vectors with uh, zero covariance like this it's uh, really easy to extract a lot of information so for example you can compute the p-value of the observation what is the probability that what you observe is due to chance and um, the other question is okay what is the number of really coupled objects and single objects in my image so if you look at the uh, maximum value of this vector, you can uh, very easily compute the p-value. So there is a formula with uh, the maximum value. And n, this is the number of annulus, big N. So you have a, a close formula for the p-value of your, of, uh, so the probability of observing something by chance. And then from this, you can detect the annulus that are far above the statistical threshold. So the threshold is a function of the number of annulus. And this is uh, like the universal threshold that is uh, commonly used in image analysis. And then you can really detect the rings where there is a statistical accumulation. And when you count the number of expected molecules in these rings compared to the expected number of molecules or spots or objects that would be there just by chance, you uh, you compute and you have a robust estimation of the number of coupled objects at each distance. And so let's say that at a given distance, I have an object. I know that at this distance, I have a given number of coupled objects. I have a given number of objects that should be there by chance. Then I can compute the probability that this specific object is here by chance or not. And so typically in an analysis, if you expect, let's say one object and you have 100, it means that you have uh, a probability of 99% of chance that each object is here through the coupling. And then you can do a lot of, uh, from, from this, you have a lot of information because you can compute the mean coupling distance, the mean number of coupled objects at different distance. So you have a lot, lot of information and this is a very versatile uh, tool because you can use it with localization or segmented spots and at different distances. So I'm just going to show you what we, we did with this, uh, with this tool. And so we analyze the coupling between three color, uh, three color spots. So in blue, Omer, and PSD95 in, in red. So these are two uh, postsynaptic uh, molecules. And we look at the opposition with some uh, synapsin in green, which is a, a marker of uh, presynaptic vesicles. And so here I, I just give you an example of what we can observe in white field and a structured illumination. Uh, just to remark, the, um, you can observe that the big spots that can be observed in white field are clearly refined in structured illumination. But more than this, we can see small spots with structured illumination that could not be seen in white field. So, um, this is also something that is uh, interesting here. And uh, so this is more or less the same information. So this is an example of the PSD and synapsin in the, and Omer in the different modalities. And, and then because we had uh, like uh, 10 images of one neuron in each image, we have uh, thousands of spots. And so we wanted to run uh, statistical analysis and especially do this automatically and robustly. And this is where we uh, went from the microscope and the images to the analysis through uh, the IC software. And the IC is, uh, is uh, really well suited for this uh, type of um, batch analysis because you have a lot of tools uh, to uh, automatize your analysis and typically open the files, run the analysis on the image, get the results, and uh, do it again uh, as long as needed. And at the, end, uh, at the end, at the end of the night, you have, a full, you have a, for example, an Excel file with all the results for 100 images, and then, uh, then you need to work. And so this is exactly what we did. We uh, designed a protocol to uh, segment the neurons, detect the spots in the different colors, analyze the coupling between color one and two, two and three, one and three, then uh, integrate all this information and get a lot of statistics or so how many objects are coupled at which distance, what are the size of the spots that are coupled, etc. 
So I'm just going to uh, run a small uh, videos that I recorded on my computer, which is okay. Uh, or you can do this uh, with IC. So you have to download IC, you have to download the, the Soda uh, three color online protocol. Then this protocol is, uh, is already uh, online. So you just open it and it, it charge with a lot of links. So a protocol is a series of blocks that are going to compute uh, a lot of um, image analysis blocks. And the links is, for example, when you detect spots, to link the spots to the colocalization analysis, etc. It's really like uh, doing some uh, plumbery, plumbing. And um, so a first area spot is really like the general parameter. What are the stressors you're applying to detect your spots or your mask? Then uh, there is three soda block to detect the coupling between color one, two, two, three, one, three. And the remaining is really to extract, okay, which spots are single, which spots are coupled only with two, one only with two and not with three, one with two, with three, et cetera, and export all the results in Excel files and images. And so at the end, so after, uh, like for example, for a wall neuron with uh, 10,000 spots, uh, I think it takes something like a few minutes, maybe three minutes. So it was for 10 images. And so at the end, you have a lot of um, Excel files. So here is an Excel file with all the coupling data at the different distances. So each line of the Excel file is the results in one analysis. And then you can combine the information for the wall analysis. And you have also images that you can just uh, drag and drop in the IC software and observe the, the mass, the region of interest that are for single molecules. So single molecules is for example, two without one, without three. Or here I am I'm going to uh, under, underline one with two with three. So these are the homers that are with PSD and with synapsin. So these are the three part three parted uh, synapses. Also the same with, with synapses that are in trio. And so I'm going just to, to show you where are the synapses with three molecules. And above that, we have, for example, uh, synapses with only two uh, spots, PSD and Omer, or some with only Omer and synapses, etc. So it's, at the end, we have a lot of information, and then you can do uh, a lot of uh, of graphs and, info and having a lot of information. So this is just a summary. We uh, observed that typically the spots that were alone were smaller. And then a lot of them were um, as a, just a couple. So they were a little bit bigger, uh, but uh, smaller than the spots that were in a trio. We had the histogram of the distance because you remember that we have the information of the coupling at each annulus. So we have the information of the coupling distance and how it is distributed. And so for example, here we observe that the distance between um, PSD and Omer, so this is in red and blue, is much lower than the distance between PSD or Omer from PSD 95, or from synapsin, sorry, because synapsin is in, on the other side of, uh, of, the, of the synapse. And what is really important is that we can see the arrangement of the synapse with the synapses that is uh, in face of uh, the PSD95. So the PSD95 is really at the PSD. And the Omer is slightly uh, behind and uh, slightly like um, on the side of the synapse. And this is something that have been observed with very few examples in electron microscopy. And uh, uh, I don't remember, but yes. And the next slide is that actually what I show with uh, structural illumination and spot, etc., is completely also applicable to single uh, localizations. So you have to segment a region of interest. So this is something that we do. So we uh, segment the presynaptic button uh, by looking at the cluster and actually we use a DV scan. And inside the presynaptic clusters, we look at the coupling between single uh, molecule localizations at different distances. And we extract molecules that were single or coupled. So here between synapsin and viglet. So these are two markers of presynaptic molecules. And uh, what we observed is that they, they were indeed coupled with uh, a mean distance of uh, something like 60 nanometers. So the size, uh, more or less than 40 nanometers, so the size of a synaptic molecules. 
and a stoichiometry that was uh, in line of uh, what have been observed with uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, so, I'm, okay, I'm already at the conclusion. So, um, as I show you, there is a lot of standard tools, but these tools are, uh, how to say, most of standard tools are not really efficient for increased resolution and, is, and also for localization-based microscopy. And more than that, it's really hard to give an interpretation of your results. What is the probability that what I am observing is due to chance? And uh, can I map which are my localization or my objects that are single or coupled? And so this is why we have developed this uh, statistical analysis at different distances and implemented it in, uh, in IC to really get uh, statistical information at different distance between different objects. And this works uh, in wide field, confocal, uh, SIM, or uh, localization by microscopy and 2D and 3D. And so the agreement, so I mean, uh, we acknowledge Institut Pasteur and uh, all the other um, like CNRS, INR that are uh, financing the lab and this research in, in particular. Centre de Psychiatrie and Neurosciences, this is uh, the center of, of Lydia that is really helping and especially through the uh, imaging facility. They have a great imaging facility. Um, everything is uh, available in IC. IC has a strong support from uh, France Bioimaging. And I really think uh, no bias for uh, this invitation and for, um, I mean, what they do because really um, they really build a community around uh, bioimage analysis and that's, uh, that's really nice. So from here, I would like to thank you and uh, I'm going to stop talking and uh, listen to questions if there are some questions. Thank you. Yes, so we have some questions. Some of them have been answered uh, online, but the, the first question was, uh, can, you, uh, can you have a specific file format and uh, or, or um, can you use uh, whatever CSV file uh, to load your localization? Uh, no, there is no format. You, so um, typically you're uh, uploading uh, an Excel file. And uh, this, so there is two types of protocols. And I see there is a protocol for uh, general imaging where you detect spots, etc. And there is a protocol that is really dedicated to uh, localization microscopy. And in this protocol, you have a first series of blocks. So everything is explained online with the documentation, but you have a series of blocks where you're going to choose the number of the column that contains the localization in X, the other one in Y, and the other one in Z, if you are in 3D. And you have even a column where you specify the number of photons, and you can specify that you just want to use as a localization with uh, more than a uh, given number of photons. So this is a series of blocks that is really going to specify the column of your Excel file for the localization. Hope I'm clear. Uh, Thibaut, can you just give the name of the protocol you're talking about? Um, this is uh, Is it the Storm 3D? Yeah, Storm 3D soda. Yeah. And there is a Storm 2D soda. And there is, a, I mean, and then so in the protocol Storm, so you have to specify the colon. And uh, um, I talk rapidly, but you also specify how you are going to build your clusters. And in IC, the, I mean, what we have is a DB scan. So you have to specify some parameters of the DB scan to segment the clusters because um, so that is going to look inside the clusters and look at the uh, single uh, localization inside uh, the segmented clusters. So the approach is um, completely different from the other approach in the localization by microscopy, where more or less you're going to look at how the clusters interact or overlap or uh, correlate. Here, you segment the cluster and directly look inside uh, at the molecular level, at the single molecular level. 
there is one more question and that says for the formation of the annuli for non circular objects does it match the contours of the objects or does it assume always assume circular shells um so actually with what i presented today it was really based on the center of mass so everything was circular but uh we are now generalizing the approach and consider the the shape of the object and the contour and then the annulus is no more an annulus but is more an isoline that is uh, following the contour of the object and that is uh, expanding from the contour of the object and um, this can be found in a recent uh, publication so first author is uh, Suvadip Mukherjee and this has been uh, published in um, signal processing letters in 2020 and uh, available the plugin will be available uh, very soon with all the documentation another question is that uh, can localization error be incorporated in the two color analysis uh, it should <laughs> this is also in progress so so yeah, yeah it should uh, because uh, right now to model the localization or the coupling. We model this with some uh, point processes and and so a, process, uh, a point process is going to be coupled at some distance but definitely we are not thinking about how to incorporate the localization error in uh, the computation and also the resolution because typically from the resolution you cannot have two points that are closer than the resolution limit even in SMLM. So typically this also uh, complicates the analysis. And so we are working on this uh, theoretical aspect. Another question is that, uh, how, uh, how do you uh, load your SML data in IC? So I think you, you partly answered in the previous question. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah. typically, so the, the basic uh, file is an Excel file with the localization. And then uh, most of these tools are available in uh, the protocols in IC. And so there is a series of blocks where you're going to specify where your file is and which columns of your Excel files are containing the X, Y, and Z uh, of your localizations. Yes, so you, you do not need to reformat your data. You just have to load it and yeah, yeah. create the column. Yes. Yes, there is no yes, there is no formatting, but uh, at the end you, you you need the localization in CSV or Excel file. Okay, I think uh, there is no more question. 